Hey there, thanks for tuning in to Faith Community Online. While you're here, let us know where you're joining from and also let us know if there's anything that sticks out to you throughout the message. We hope you're encouraged and inspired to move from where you are to where God wants you to be. Let's dive in. We're talking about the Holy Spirit, and the title of the series is The Mysterious One. And every week we've been asking a question and attempting to answer uh, that question about the Holy Spirit. And one week is kind of building upon the other. So if you've missed any, I would encourage you to grab those online. And week number one, we asked the question, who is he? Who is he? Week number two was, is he a person? And last week was, is he Pentecostal? Is he Pentecostal? This week, when I asked the question about the Holy Spirit is, does he baptize? Does he baptize? As a matter of fact, what we'll see today is there are, in fact, three baptisms talked about in Scripture that God wants us to each to participate in and to be a part of. There are three separate baptisms. And I want to begin by uh, just defining what baptism means according to Scripture. Now, the word baptism or baptizo in the Greek, here's, here's what it means. It means to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, like a vessel being sunk, like a a ship, excuse me, being sunk in the ocean. It is baptized in the ocean as it sits in the bottom or to be uh, overwhelmed. So not just a dipping and pulling out quickly, but a total submersion, a total overwhelming and uh, or a repeated kind of a process. Now, I think one of the good examples of this actually comes, I was reading and doing some study from this uh, writing around 200 BC about this Greek physician and poet. He writes about these words in the Greek for baptism. Now, 200 BC is about 200 years before Jesus came to the earth. And he's writing about these these words. They, They had two words. One's like bapto, the other one is baptizo. We're talking about baptizo. And he writes about the difference between the two. And I want to read this excerpt to you because I think it's pretty interesting. He said that this word should not be confused with bapto. The clearest example shows the meaning of baptizo is a text from the Greek poet and physician Nicander, who lived about 200 BC. It is a recipe for making pickles. Anybody like pickles? I'd rather eat a pickle than a cucumber any day. But anyway, and it is helpful because it uses both words. The candor says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetables should be first dipped, bapto, in the boiling water, and then baptized, baptizo, in the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern the immersing of vegetables in a solution, but the first is temporary. The second, the act of baptizing the vegetable, produces a permanent change. Now, a pickle cannot be a pickle because a pickle doesn't exist. It must first be a cucumber, right? And simply taking a cucumber and dipping it in boiling water does not change the cucumber at all. It is a dip and it's back out. It's when you take that cucumber and you baptize it in the vinegar, the pickling solution, that a permanent change is produced and it is a pickle, right? We no longer refer to pickles as cucumbers. We call them pickles because something permanently has changed within them. Permanently. Like grapes and raisins, yes, like grapes and raisins. So what I am talking about today is not simply a question of being dipped like in a vat of boiling water and pulled back out, asking does he baptize. We're talking about something that produces a permanent change on the inside of us, that we become brand new people. We become different people. We become the, the children of God. Does the Holy Spirit baptize is and also is there a baptism in the holy spirit i want to talk through three things today because there are three baptisms three baptisms that we that we have in christianity we have first we have what's called salvation is being baptized into the thing we have we have water baptism and we have spirit baptism we're going to talk through those three today but we're going to spend most of our time talking about the baptism in the holy spirit not the baptism of the holy spirit Of and in, although they are prepositions, they are two different words. There's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, something the Holy Spirit does, and then there's the baptism in, the submersion, the baptism, the pickling of the Holy Spirit. I want to drop this thought because this will be the only thing you remember from the whole message. The Holy Spirit wants to make you a pickle. All right? That's what I want want you to get that in your mind. The Holy Spirit wants to make you a pickle. Here's point number one. We'll fly through the first two. Point number one is the Holy Spirit baptizes us in Jesus. 
The Holy Spirit baptizes us in Jesus. The Holy Spirit introduces us to Jesus. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Paul writing here, some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. What's he saying? Hey, we have a wide variety of people here coming from different backgrounds, all right? But he says, we have all been, read it, baptized, I'm assuming it's behind me, into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. So we all are disparate people coming from disparate backgrounds, but if we are Christ followers, we've all been baptized into the family of God by the person of the Holy Spirit. We are the family of God. We are the people of God, and it doesn't matter what race, ethnicity, language, socioeconomic status, male or female, we are all together as the people of God because of the work of the Holy Spirit introducing us to the person of Jesus. We've been baptized as children of God, producing a permanent change in us. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not to be confused with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Did you ever think there would be that big of a difference between of and in? (laughs) Two-letter words, vastly different. So the Holy Spirit introduces us to Jesus, makes us aware of Jesus, draws us to Jesus. We come to know Jesus, salvation. We're baptized into the family of God. Point number one, we're already done. You're like, whoa, that's amazing. Point number two, because we're going to spend most of the time on three. Point number two, the disciples baptize us in water. And when you hear disciples, think of pastors, church leaders. They baptize us in water. Matthew 28, verse 19 Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, same word, baptizo, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we see throughout Scripture that there is this baptism in water. We see it primarily with John the Baptist, right? And his most famous person that he baptizes is Jesus. There's this water baptism, which is the baptism reflecting the repentance of sin, right? That we are a Christ follower. And that we are, we are symbolically, we're going down as this old person, old sin nature. We are coming up, reemerging after we've been submerged as a new person, new life, new nature. Just like Jesus went into the grave, dying as our punishment for sin. He reemerges three days later. He's resurrected to new life, right? That is that symbolic process. We die to sin. We are raised to life. Now, it's important to understand, water baptism does not save us. God saves us, right? Because of Jesus, water baptism is a, is a mark or a, it's a, an announcement to the world that we are Christ followers. And I don't just want to leave it in the realm of symbolism. There is something unique and mysterious to it. I haven't quite fully understood yet that when you are baptized, it's part of the process that God has set forth. That's water baptism. Holy Spirit introduces us to Jesus. Disciples, pastors, remember, baptize us in water, repentance of sin. Now we get to point number three. Can you already believe we're on point number three? Don't worry, we'll be here a long time. So, here a long time. Here's the third one, the third baptism. We had salvation, we had water, now we have spirit. Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. We're pretty good with being baptized in the family of God, very comfortable with water baptism. It gets to this point where we start talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that some of us may begin to diverge in our understanding, opinion, and knowledge of what this may be. Last week, we did a pretty fascinating thing where we took a survey of the room, and we have a wide diversity of Uh, Christianity represented in here, denominationally speaking. So however you grew up really informs what you believe about this piece right here, about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and Jesus actually doing the baptism. Now, I just want to say this from the beginning because we said this last week about Pentecost. When you become a Christ follower, step number one, baptism in the family of God, the Holy Spirit lives in you. You have the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you, okay? So we're not saying about the baptism in the Holy Spirit that if you don't have the baptism in the Holy Spirit that you don't have the Holy Spirit. I am categorically not saying that because some denominations teach that, okay? So that's what I'm I'm not saying. But 
This point right here that Jesus baptizing in the Holy Spirit is a separate and subsequent thing that he does. All three of these do not happen simultaneously at the point of conversion. And this is so important that this is in all four Gospels. All four Gospels. You say, hey, where, can you show me where it says Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit? You guys ask really good questions, okay? I can show you. Because in all four Gospels, it records this. And there are very few things that appear in all four Gospels. So listen to this. We'll go to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to look at all of these. Matthew 3, verse 11, and we've got a, a fair amount of scripture to make our way through today because I want you to see biblically what we're talking about. This is John the Baptist speaking. I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be a slave or carry his sandals. He will baptize you, capital H-E, Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, and with fire. He is Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, let me pause before we read the other three passages. Some people will say that what John the Baptist is talking about here is a baptism specifically for the disciples. Problem is, Jesus didn't call his disciples till chapter 4, and we're in chapter 3, and John is speaking to a crowd of people saying, one will come who is greater, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He was not talking specifically to the 12 disciples. This is not exclusive to Matthew. This is not exclusive to just the people who lived during biblical times. This is for you and I today. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. All right, now... Let's go back and let's look at the other three passages in the Gospels. This is Mark. John speaking, Mark 1.8. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Speaking of Jesus. Luke 3.16. John answered their question saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater, kind of sounds like Matthew, doesn't it, that I'm not even worthy to be a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John 1.33, I didn't know he was the one. This is John again. But when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. All four Gospels tell us the same thing, that Jesus Christ baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. Now, you say, what does this really look like? You're saying that in, in, in salvation, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in me, and so now you're telling me that I need more of the Holy Spirit, like I don't have all of him. And we talked a little bit about this last week, about Pentecost. And I was given a, a teaching. Someone said, hey, Josh, I think you really enjoy this. It was a teaching from Joyce Meyer, and she was just talking about the Holy Spirit. And she made this statement. She was talking about how when she first got saved, and she was in the 1970s, part of a Lutheran environment that didn't teach primarily, didn't teach this aspect of Holy Spirit baptism. She said, once I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, she said, what I realized is, is that before I had the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit didn't have me. I'm not making a theological statement. I'm trying to get us to understand kind of what this looks like. I had the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit didn't have all of me. I was dipped like a cucumber, but the Holy Spirit wanted to make me a pickle. A permanent change in me. Permanent change. Before we move on, I want to just ask us to begin to think of what it would look like, if you haven't, to really pursue and begin to create a space in your mind for the, the possibility that the Holy Spirit wants to do more in your life, and there's this third baptism he has for you. This third thing, that there is more. That simply just being saved, while that gets you to heaven, we're not talking about any of that, is good and wonderful and amazing. And water baptism, wonderful, amazing, but there's more. So much so that Jesus said, go and wait. And we're going to see, scripturally, we're going to see this pattern emerge. And it's going to emerge in Acts, and then I'm going to take you all the way back to the Old Testament, and we'll see the same pattern there. Jesus is our example, right? We, we wouldn't argue with that. Jesus is who we want to emulate, right? And if Jesus did something, that's probably what we want to do, emulate his life. Now, the pattern is this, and we've already said it, 
Salvation, water, spirit. Salvation, water, spirit. Jesus is our pattern, and he experienced all three. Now, I'm not saying Jesus needed to get saved, but I want to pause here for a moment and just talk about that. What happens at salvation is this. At salvation, we are reborn as children of God. Jesus has this discussion with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Out of that discussion comes John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the most famous verse. It's a discussion. Nicodemus is a, is a religious leader, very smart guy. He comes to Jesus at, the, at, at night because he doesn't want the other people to know he's talking to him. And he's like, what must I do? Like, how, how do we follow you? And Jesus says, you must, you must be born again. Nicodemus is smart. He said, I'm a grown man. How in the world would I get back into my mother's womb to be born again? I'm glad that Nicodemus had that discussion because it's like I kind of had the same question. And Jesus says, Nicodemus, it's not a physical rebirth. It is a spiritual rebirth that you were born into this world as, as a sinner and you will be reborn as a child of God. We all must be reborn. That's what happens in salvation. We are reborn as a son or a daughter of God, a permanent change. Old nature, sin is gone. New nature is present. Jesus never had to be saved, but he was born into this earth as a child of God. He was born. Born, all right? So he didn't have to be saved, but, but he's our pattern. Was he water baptized? Who baptized him? John the Baptist, right? He baptizes Jesus in water. It's an amazing scene. When he does it, this voice from heaven comes. It's the Father. He says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then this unique thing happens. The Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. It's important to note that a dove didn't flap down from heaven and land on his shoulder. It's like a dove. Sometimes the wind blows like a hurricane. But has there ever been a hurricane in Missouri? No, it's describing something. Is it possible a dove floated down from heaven and landed on his shoulder? Possible. But the point of that is the Holy Spirit descended upon him. So Jesus, born as a child of God in the earth, water baptized, Holy Spirit descends, baptizes him. So Jesus goes through the pattern. Spirit, or salvation, water, and spirit. Now, if Jesus went through that, and Jesus is our model, is it, is it okay to say that Jesus wants us to go through the same thing? That, that pattern is something that we, will, that we will follow, that God has set that forth for us to, to go through that, that process, so to speak. Now, again, what happens at salvation? Reborn, saved, baptized in the family of God. What happens in water baptism? Old man goes down. New person comes back up. What happens in spirit baptism? We are empowered to live a victorious life. Empowerment happens. Power. It says in Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be endued with power. The power of God comes to live in you. And that's the, where the pickling begins to happen. Where you don't just have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has you and begins to change you. We could say it happens instantaneously, or we can say it happens uh, be a process. I just think it happens both end. Instantaneous change, bam, power, fill, process of change in our lives. But power, how many of you could, would stand to say, I could use more power in my life? Now, I don't mean like Marvel superhero power, okay? I'm talking about that. But the power to live everyday life. How many of you are bound up in things? Maybe it's drug addiction or just anxiety, fear, sexual addiction, substance, whatever the case, maybe you're bound up by something and you say, I need power in my life. Yeah, I need power. I need power to be a better husband, power to be a better wife, power to be a better parent, power to be a better friend, power to be better with my finances, power to be a better coworker, power to be a better boss. We need power. We need something other than us to assist us to live a victorious life. Not a life free from problems, not a life free from pain, not a life free from issues, but power to overcome. Amen. The Holy Spirit wants to do that for us. Clap, clap. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Good stuff. Wants to do that. Yes, I'm for counseling, I'm for doctors, I'm for medication when it's appropriate. I'm not saying Holy Spirit or but I'm saying he wants to empower you. 
30 years of the same issue. He wants to empower you. He wants your marriage to be better than you want it to be. He wants to, your kids to grow up, you know, and do all the things that you want them to do more than you. He wants to empower you. I think in 2020, we need some empowerment. It goes, that's the easy one, right? That's the easy one. We need some empowerment. How do we live this life? How do, we, how do we do what God's called us to do when everything around us is unstable? How do we have stability? How do we have hope? How do we have power? How do, it's the baptism in the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit. And Jesus did that at the beginning of his ministry. The beginning. He had not done one miracle. One miracle when he was baptized. God said, I'm proud of you. You're my son. I'm well pleased in you. Now here's the empowerment while you're on earth. Go. It's the beginning. The day of Pentecost happens at the beginning of the church. The beginning. Jesus said, wait. You need empowerment. You need empowerment. It's the beginning. It's the commissioning. It's the endowment of power. I asked, do we need it? My answer is a resounding yes. Yes, we need it. We need it. But this pattern, can I get back to the pattern? All right, let me get back to the pattern. I want to read in the book of Acts, just show you some references in Acts of, of this pattern beginning to emerge in the New Testament. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, we read this last week. This is the day of Pentecost. You'll see this pattern, salvation, water, spirit. You'll see they believed, they repented, they were baptized, they received. You'll see that, okay? They believe and repent are right there in the same way, but I want you to see this pattern unfold. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God this day of Pentecost and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Repent, salvation, baptized water for the forgiveness of sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Spirit, Spirit baptism. This is a promise to you, your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. That's the day of Pentecost. Now let's fast forward to Acts chapter 8, verses 12 through 16. But now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, as a result, many men and women were baptized, part two of the pattern. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went and was amazed by the signs and great miracles Philip performed. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, this is what they did, they prayed for these new believers to, say it, receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus. So these people were saved, water baptized. Peter and John show up, and the first thing they pray for is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So they had yet to receive. They had Jesus. They had been baptized in water, but the Holy Spirit, they had yet to receive him. I want to ask this question, because maybe this is what you're thinking. How long after Pentecost did this occur? Five years. This is five years after the day of Pentecost. So when we read the Bible, we flip from one chapter to the next. We're like, well, that was a Monday. This has got to be a Tuesday. Right? There's 20 chapters in Acts. There's like 20 days. No. This is a span of time. Five years later, the pattern is still there. It's interesting when you read it, because... Did they have the Holy Spirit living with them? Yes. Did they have Jesus? Yes. Were they going to heaven? 100%. Water baptized? Yes. Holy Spirit had not yet come. They had yet to receive the baptism in. And the first thing Peter and John did was pray for that. First thing. Now, let's go all the way to, the, to Acts uh, 19, verses 1 through 6. Now, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Ephesus, we just did a whole series on the letter that Paul wrote to Ephesus to the Ephesians. And he asked him this question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So he, he's on a missionary journey. He stumbles upon these people who believe in Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey, and he's coming from Jerusalem. So the gospel had already begun to spread. How cool is that? And he says, hey, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Listen to their reply. Nope. We haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. You want to know how long this is after the day of Pentecost? 25 years. 25 years after the day of Pentecost. Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? We didn't even know. How many of us have grown up in denominations and backgrounds? And here today I say, 
Have you ever heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? In the Holy Spirit, excuse me, correct myself. And you say, I didn't even know. I didn't even know. Or I was told that no longer happens. Or I saw some really weird people. <laughs> or I watched too many YouTube videos. And I'm weirded out. But Paul's first question, have you received? Peter and John, first thing, let's receive. And they said, we didn't even know. He said, then what baptism did you experience? They replied, the baptism of John, which is water. Okay? Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later. We read four passages of that, right? Meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. 25 years after Pentecost, the pattern, believe, baptize, receive. Believe, baptize, receive. Jesus' pattern, believe, baptize, receive. They were still going at it 25 years later. And isn't it interesting? It wasn't simultaneous. They had to be told about what it was. We can't receive something that we aren't aware of. Right? Have you received? And they did. There's another passage in Acts 10 that talks about this too with Gentile believers. And I think it's like 10 years after Pentecost. This pattern is emerging. Now, that's what we see in the New Testament. We would call that the pattern of the New Testament church. We see it unfold over a course of years, not days. Now, I want to show you in the Old Can I show you in the Old Testament where the pattern was the same? I'm going to show you in the Old Testament, but I'm going to take you to 1 Corinthians to show you about the Old Testament, and then we'll go back to the Old Testament. We, that we, we, we see this pattern as well in the Old Testament. Believe, baptize, receive. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, he says this in chapter 10, 1 Corinthians verses 1 and 2. He says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. He's saying, hey, guys, don't forget that once we were enslaved in Egypt, and then we were in the wilderness. Don't want you to forget about that. He says, listen, all of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on, on ground, dry ground. But listen to this. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were, say it, as followers of Moses. Now, let, let's pause and just talk about some types and shadows. The Old Testament is full of types and shadows of Jesus and of what is to come. In the Old Testament, they, he said, cloud. Cloud is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The cloud was in the sky by day. It led them. It guided them to the promised land. And the promised land has always been about Jesus. It's always been Jesus. All right? So the cloud represents the Holy Spirit. The cloud would descend at the tent of meeting with Joshua and Moses, the whole, signifying the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. They says they were walked across on dry ground. The sea, the sea is water, baptism. They went through the water on dry ground, came out the other side. What was death, you know, came out the other side. And then it says, as followers of Moses. Moses is a type or a picture of Jesus. He is the one who saved them from slavery. He led them out into the wilderness. In, in their belief system, Moses is like, he's El Hombre. He is the guy. There is no one greater than Moses, all right? He's a picture of Jesus. They were baptized, three-part process, salvation, water, spirit. It's represented in that statement, representing. The writer, Paul, just, he, he just flips, the, he flips one and three. He just puts the Holy Spirit first. Spirit, water, followers of Moses. He could have said followers of Moses, water, cloud. It's the pattern, salvation, water, spirit, Okay. That's just part of the coolness. Here's the ultimate coolness, all right, that I think. I want to take a look at the temple, okay, the tabernacle. So we'll go back to the Old Testament. So God, God gives instructions to the children of Israel as they're going through the wilderness to the promised land. He wants to commune with them. He wants to be in the, in the center of them, and he gives instructions to build this tabernacle. This is like this, this moving church, so to speak. Some of the most difficult yet interesting reading in the Old Testament is the description of how to build the temple. It goes on and on and on, detail after detail after detail. The redeeming factor of it, you'll see here in a moment, it's all pointing to Jesus. God is so specific, so intentional with the description of the tabernacle because it's always pointing to the person of Jesus Christ. So 
I want to show you just a crude drawing of the tabernacle. If you look it up online, there'll be way more detailed pictures. I just want to see this as a progression so we can see this pattern emerge, okay? So here's the tabernacle, kind of laid out in a rectangle, okay? And you have at the beginning, you have the entrance. And you know what's so cool? There was just one way into the tabernacle, only one way to the presence of God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. You got one way in, right? One way. There's no other way to God. Not all religions, all roads lead to God. That is not true. There's one way, and his name is Jesus. There was one way into the tabernacle. Then you had the holy place and the most holy place. That's where the presence of God dwelled, the, the incense, and the, and the main purpose of going into the tabernacle was to get to the presence of God, to be with him. Okay. Now, they had to go through a series of things to get there so that they could be in the right state of mind, the right state in their body, and they go through some certain things. Okay, here's the first thing that they would encounter, all right? They would encounter this. They would encounter an altar, and on that altar would be a sacrifice and would be the blood of that sacrifice signifying the forgiveness of sins, all right? They had to sacrifice animals as a, as a substitute for their own sin. The blood would cleanse, and it would be a purification thing. So they would, they would first go through this altar and see the blood of the lamb, which is... Salvation. Jesus has become for us, as we talked about in communion and last week, the Passover lamb. It is by his blood that we are saved and set free and forgiven and covered, baptized into the family of God. The first thing that they had to see was this altar, the blood of the lamb, okay? Secondly, they would come to this laver. What is a laver? It's basically like a wash basin that had like holy water in it. And they would have to purify themselves, clean themselves, make sure they were fit and ready to go. This is a signification of water baptism, the washing away of the old man, of the residue of sin, all right? That washing that happens at the laver. That was part two. Here was part three. Before they would go in, they would encounter this flask of oil, right? Oil in the Old Testament is also symbolic of the Holy Spirit, the oil of the Spirit. They would anoint the priest with oil. Oil was considered to be symbolic of the Holy Spirit. They would be anointed with this oil. By the time they get to the presence of God, they have gone through the forgiveness of sins, the washing of that occurs, and the anointing or the baptizing of the Spirit to get to be in the presence of God. So what we see in the tabernacle is this pattern, salvation, water, spirit. This is a clapping moment. I'll just let you know. (laughs) Why is it a clapping moment? Because God didn't just look at Jesus and say, huh, I got an idea. I think this guy's going to do some pretty cool stuff in 33 years. Let's figure it out. God has never had an idea. Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. This was God's plan. Jesus was always God's plan. This is symbolic. This is a precursor. This is a picture showing us what is to come. God was not unintentionally or just just saying, hey, yeah, do this stuff. I want to make it hard for you. No. There was a point and a process to everything that he was doing. Here's the beautiful thing. We no longer have to make a sacrifice. Jesus is our sacrifice. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. We no longer have to wash ourselves before we come into church. Can you imagine if we had a big old laver out there and you all came in and just washing yourself, especially during COVID, right? Like, I gotta get clean before I walk in there. That'd be weird, right? We don't have to do that. We've been washed. Baptized that old is gone, the new has come. We're, we're clean before God. Clean before God because of Jesus. And we're not dumping oil on you either. Now we do symbolically anoint with oil at times when we pray. It's just a, a point of connection. But the Holy Spirit wants to drench you in his oil. He wants to make you a pickle. Right? You'll remember that. To pickle you. And it's all because of Jesus. And we have full access to be in the presence of God at all times. Hebrews says we can come to the throne of grace knowing that we may receive grace and mercy in our time of need. We can come because of Jesus. See, that's the beautiful thing. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to try. We receive it. 
Now, let me just back up for a moment. I don't want you to think I'm saying you got to do all three to be saved. I'm not. Step one, salvation, 100%. You're secure in your relationship with God. Step two, taking that step, announcing to yourself, announcing to the world, I'm saved. I've gone down an old person. I've come up a new person. It doesn't have anything to do with salvation as far as securing it. Step three, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Not talking about salvation. Okay, so, so hear me, hear me. Don't think, because there's some people that teach that. I'm not, I'm not teaching that. But what I'm saying is, is this pattern is baked into the fabric of who God is. So when we talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's not just appearing in Acts. Jesus demonstrated it. The setup of the tabernacle of God all the way back in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, demonstrates it. And just think for a moment that if that was God's intention all along, is that what he would have for you and I today? To receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. To be drenched, to be submerged, to be overwhelmed, to be pickled, however you want to say it. In the Holy Spirit. For a permanent change. A permanent change. A permanent change. Sometimes coming to service is like just being dipped. You're like, got to go next week. Got to be dipped. Got to be dipped. No, no, no. You just need to be submerged. Be dropped in there. Coming, this is wonderful. This is great. This is part of being the family of God. But God doesn't want this to be the thing you need every week just to make it by. And if it is right now, that's okay. I'm just here to tell you, there's more. There's more. There's more. And I don't, yeah, you can clap. That's cool. And I don't want us to think that this is only about speaking in tongues. That'll be week six. We're getting there, I promise. <laughs> but I don't want you to think that baptism is speaking in tongues. So much more than that. So much more than that. He wants to change you and empower you so that you can live a completely different life so that things and people and substances and experiences no longer have authority and a hold of you. But there's a power inside of you, the Holy Spirit, that'll change you. So I end with this question. Do we need it? Yes. Do you have to have it? No. I need a diet. I don't have to have it. Don't think of something you have to. Think of it as something you get to have. You get to. You get to. But where do you find yourself on this spectrum, on this pattern? Some of you may just need to, I just need step one. I need to give my life to Christ. I need to respond to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit introduces me to Jesus and then Jesus introduces me to the Holy Spirit. It's just step one. I, I just need to get saved. I just need to be baptized in the family of God. Maybe some of you need, you know, I've never been water baptized. Or maybe you were as a kid and you have no memory of it. You say, I just need to be water baptized. And we're trying to figure that out with COVID. As soon as we do, we'll let you know and you can get water baptized. Be happy to do so. Some of you, some of you maybe just, I need the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I was eight years old when I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I grew up in church my whole life. I heard about it. You know, you say, at eight, your whole life, a long, a long time. But I, I'm born and raised in the pew. Heard about it. I was at a camp called Camp David, about an hour from here, near Deloge, Missouri. Old A-frame chapel, open air, concrete floors, uh, incredibly uncomfortable wooden benches, mosquitoes everywhere. You smelled off. Someone would spray off right in front of you. You'd be sucking on DEET for the rest of the night. <laughs> you know, but a lot of amazing things happen. At eight years old, they gave an altar call for I don't know what. I went forward off to the right-hand corner. I prayed. No one prayed for me. No one was around. At eight years old, I said, God, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I was. And I was. And I, at that night, I spoke in tongues. At eight years old, in fact, I have, still have the Bible from that night I wrote in it, June 7th, 1980, uh, 1993. 1993. I wrote it in my little cursive. 
Why, why do you share that story, Josh? I share it because all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is ask. It doesn't have to be weird. I saw a lot of weird stuff. People praying for you, telling you where the Holy Spirit was in your body. He's not in your head. He's in your mouth. He's in your chest. He's in your feet. He's out here. Say this. Don't say this. Craziness. Hey, nobody prayed. Nobody told me anything. I just said, Holy Spirit, or God, would you baptize me in the Holy Spirit? I want to give you the same opportunity. Yeah, November 11th is going to be a night where we come and we can specifically pray for you, and I think it's going to be awesome. But right here in this moment, whatever step it is that you need to take, if you're here and you say, I, I, yeah, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. What's going to happen? I don't know. It's not up to me. But I believe that the Holy Spirit will begin to submerge you in who he is. You may cry. Nothing may happen. You may experience something on the way home, tomorrow, next week. I don't know. That's not the point. The point is, I want this. I need this. So we're just going to pause for a few moments. And, you know, like I've done every week, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? What do you want me to do? But maybe you could just say, Holy Spirit, if you're ready, if you're ready, it's fine wherever you're at on this journey. Would you baptize me in the Holy Spirit? Just ask that question. So bow your heads. We'll take a few seconds here, and then I'll pray. Holy Spirit, what are you saying? What do you want me to do? Or would you baptize me in the Holy Spirit? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this sacred, holy moment. Pray for any individual that says, you know what, I just, I need need the first part of this process. I, I just need salvation. I need to be forgiven and set free and baptized in the family of God. I pray, Father, may they echo a prayer of something like this, that Father, would you forgive me? Would you save me? Would you set me free? Would you become the Lord of my life? Secondly, Lord, I just pray for anybody that wanted to take that step today and say, Holy Spirit, baptize me. I pray in the name of Jesus that you, Jesus, you would baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Baptize them in the Holy Spirit. May they receive the Holy Spirit. That infilling, that indwelling, that that saturation, submersion, that pickling that you have for us. Baptize in the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Jesus, for being so faithful, being so good to do this for us. I pray as, also, Lord, as you, you do that work for anybody here and anybody at home, that, Lord, you would also just minister to marriages and families and, 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 and single individuals here, single mom, uh, moms and single fathers and, and just family situations, whatever the case may be. You would provide. You would show yourself faithful, Father, financially in areas of mental health and, and, and emotional health that, Lord, you just bring healing and power and freedom from addiction, freedom from substance abuse, Lord. We just pray, Holy Spirit, you begin to do such a powerful work on the inside of our hearts that then manifests itself into the the, the, the uh, external realities that we're all facing. We thank you for being faithful and being good. And although you are mysterious, you are powerful and you are wonderful. And you are called as a helper fit. You're summoned as our paraclete. And we thank you. And we conclude, Father, by just praying this blessing over, over us, this blessing you put in, in the book of Numbers. Just pray that the Lord would bless you and protect you. Pray that he would make his face to smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.
Hey, thanks for joining Faith Community online today. If you're new here or you made the decision to follow Jesus, we would love the opportunity to connect with you and let you know your next steps. Real quick, text NEW TO FAITH to 97000 and someone from our team will be in touch soon. You can also learn more about the church by visiting our website at faithcommunity.co. And hey, stay in touch over on social media. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and shoot us a DM if you have any questions. And if there's anything that you would like prayer for today, please let us know. You can send an email to prayer at faithcommunity.co or even submit a request through the app. And someone from our team would love to pray for you and specifically over the need that's going on in your life. Thanks again for being here today. We'll see you next time.